Thank you, Donna, Dee Dee, and Paul for that uh, introduction of this great day. And I have the privilege of introducing one of my uh, great friends in this conference and has been for all the years that I've been here. One of the first pastors I met and one that I grew close to r r very quickly. And I can say with great confidence we'll be hearing from one of the best preachers in this conference and that has been the case for many years now Ron you have a lot to live up to now but uh, Ron has led in nearly every capacity um, of uh, our conference including serving some of our greatest churches so let me just say a word about Ron related to uh, his bio and then I want to say a, a, another word or two personally about Ron Ron is, uh, has currently been the Director of Racial Diversity and Equity and Inclusion for the North Texas Conference. And before that, for eight years, he served as a District Superintendent in our North Central District of the North Texas um, Conference of the United Methodist Church. He served in pastoral appointments uh, at St. Paul United Methodist Church in downtown Dallas. He was the senior pastor at Hamilton Park United Methodist Church, and uh, then Bishop Rhymes Moncur appointed him to Custer Road United Methodist Church, which was one of our largest in the entire connection, and Ron served there very faithfully. Ron um, holds a bachelor's degree from Dallas Baptist University, a master's of divinity from Gammon Theological Seminary in Atlanta, and a doctorate of ministry from Perkins School of Theology at SMU. Now, I, I want to say on a personal note that in addition to Ron being one of the best preachers in the conference, he is definitely one of the best dressed in the conference. In, in fact, I find myself, I'm going to admit this, Ron, I've told you in private, but I'm going to tell the world today. Um, anytime I'm going to be in a meeting and close to Ron, I automatically think about my dress and just what would, you know, you, you got this, what would Jesus do? What would Ron wear is, uh, is always on my mind. So uh, uh, I, I kind of up my game when I'm, uh, when I'm around Ron re re related to dress. But, you know, I, what I want to say about Ron um, and what I've appreciated about, about him in the time that we have uh, served together in this conference is his uh, commitment, his integrity and his commitment to doing what is just and what is in the, the best interest of the United Methodist Church and in an unwavering way, un unwavering. And, and whether, you know, that has been um, being the pastor of a church and working with the laity to bring that church to greater um, heights of accomplishment and ministry and outreach or whether it has been serving in the district superintendent level where he had some of the greatest churches in our connection under his leadership and how he worked so closely with those pastors and lay leaders in those conferences to make sure those churches were, um, were doing all that God was calling them to be about and that's I think the district superintendent job is one of the hardest in our connection. Amen, Ron? Amen. Amen. Uh, and, and Ron did that quite well. He has been a delegate to General Conference countless times and is on the delegation this year, so we're going to spend a couple of weeks together in Charlotte uh, next month uh, and into May, and I'm looking forward to having that close time with him as well. But when it came to a place um, of really needing our conference to focus more on racial diversity, equity, and inclusion, uh, there was no one better to tap out than Ron Henderson. Um, and we know in a country that's so divided uh, as ours uh, has been for several years, that if the church isn't leading in this area of racial equity and diversity and inclusion, then how on earth will the larger society 
respond in a way that's keeping with what we value as Christians. And so I'm so thankful for Ron's leadership. I'm thankful for him saying yes to the invitation to preach uh, this, this uh, afternoon. And so with, uh, uh, with no further ado, I want us to give Dr. Ron Henderson a warm Lover's Lane welcome. Well, good afternoon to each of you, and uh, uh, many thanks to my dear, dear friend, uh, Dr. Stan Copeland. Um, so much I can say about him, and it's all good. <laughs> I, I would probably say, as they said, um, uh, how I have uh, liked to dress. Part of my spiritual journey now is on my spiritual journey is, is, is detaching from all of that. <laughs> Uh, which I'm finding a little hard. <laughs> um, uh, one of the focus, uh, uh, the, the real focus as I, I come before you these two days is, is identifying with the crucified Christ, not uh, Jesus of Nazareth as we know him, uh, or the resurrected Christ, but the crucified Christ. And I lift that up before I go into my uh, lecture slash sermon is because without exaggeration, uh, your pastor has embodied what it means to identify with the crucified Christ. Because to see Christ in his uh, crucifixion, uh, your pastor has consistently taken on the burdens, taken on the suffering, taking on the shame and humiliation and the battles of so many people, and particularly those who have been marginalized. And he's done it uh, biblically, spiritually, morally, again and again and again. And so as we're looking at this title over the two days, identifying with the crucified Christ, which is a great challenge to us, your pastor has done it so well. Uh, also, uh, delighted to see my friend, Donna Whitehead, Reverend Donna Whitehead, who we've also known for many years and have labored together in this vineyard of the North Texas Conference of the United Methodist Church to advance the kingdom of God and, and to advance uh, an agenda that we believe in, an agenda that is committed to God but also inclusive of all of God's people and God's creation. And I want to give my thanks to uh, Paul Ditto, uh, who is the director of this uh, lecture series. Thank you for your professionalism and for uh, uh, your assistance to me. Uh, today, uh, the title is Identifying with the Crucified Christ. It says with the intersection of devotion and service, or you can think of identifying with the crucified Christ through devotion and service. Now it's a lecture, so I'm going to do a little lecture and you all help me, maybe a little preaching too. God, we thank you for the gift of this day. We thank you for the gift of your word, your word revealed to us in holy scriptures, and your word revealed to us in the incarnation of Jesus Christ. And God, now I pray your blessings upon the preaching of your word, not for fame, not for reputation, but that someone might believe and do likewise. In the strong, perfect name of Jesus Christ, amen. Identifying with the crucified Christ, the intersection of devotion and service. I admit to you that this subject of identifying with the crucified Christ has been enlightening for me. It's been quite challenging to prepare for it. And it's been convicting as I've uh, grown in my understanding. It was kind of a challenge for me because I have come to understand that to identify with the crucified Christ is to look at, and look at as I look at how my life has been nurtured in the faith, 
my inner life devotion and my outer life service, advocacy and justice. And uh, as I hope to deal with the subject over the next two days, many of us, if not all of us, many of us often are heavy in the area of devotion as I have been and light on the side of service to others. Not all of us, but some of us. As an example, for the last 28 years, almost 30 years, I've been on this journey, a journey of uh, uh, thirsting for union and communion with God. Devotion to God, devotion to God, this thirst for God has been my quest for the last 30 years. To love God, to have communion with God, to know God and, and to love God. So I've been on this journey, I want God, and I wanted more God, and that's been my drive, my quest over the last 30 years until I looked at this title and text one more time. Now, I wasn't quite as bad as some people, as church people I remember when I grew up in Waco, as I was growing in the faith. My understanding of the church then in those formative years was that Christianity mostly consisted of going to church on Sundays and then trying to be morally upright the rest of the week. Identifying with the crucified Christ has changed my perspective uh, as I prepared this lecture sermon, it has changed. In Lent, I've looked at this text through the lenses of Lent. Lent, rightly put, emphasis on spirituality, fasting, and prayer. But also, Lent invites us to action and generosity to others. Lent invites us to balance the discipline of prayer, fasting, inner spirituality with the more outward social service oriented to others. Lent is a corrective to sedative, uh, sedative spirituality. That's to be a spirituality, to be calm and cool and not anxious. Lent is a corrective sedative to that. Lent also points to this consideration. If spirituality without action is a sedative, then what is action without a spiritual center? Any spirituality that lacks a clear commitment to addressing the pain and suffering in our world is a sedative a drug anyone could use to dull pain. So the seriousness of this text and title changed my perspective about devotion to God and action and generosity to God's creation. That's how I came up with the crucified Christ. That's uh, who I want to identify with, the crucified Christ. Looking at the crucified Christ as a way of encountering God can be difficult because people, we are not attractive to crucified bodies. We're not attracted to crucified bodies or suffering humanity. We tend to deny suffering and, and shun the disfigured, the abandoned, and the dying. We, ease, we erase their presence by ignoring them and pretending like they don't even exist so that we can direct our attention to being beautiful, wealthy, and healthy. You're with me. The text reminds us that God is revealed in fragile, frail, crucified flesh. It is in the figure of the crucified that we encounter the power of God's love. So my friends, I've been on this journey nearly 30 years, this quest to experience oneness with God, union with God, reading books on the life and practices of saints and mystics 
so that I can get my hands and head all around it. For 30 years, I've been on this journey of fasting and praying and meditation and going to retreats so that I could learn more and grasp more what it means to be one with God, only to continue this thirst again and again and again until I came to this text and Lent revealed something different to me. I've been striving to have communion, union, oneness with God, forgetting that spiritual intimacy with God leads not to two persons, but to one. Oneness with the divine. You get that now? So as I've been going through this, I've, I've come to understand that this, this union is not just two people, but one people. I hope to unveil, um, unveil that just shortly. Last week, coming from a Dallas Maverick game, my wife and I are, uh, are part-time season ticket holders, are half-season ticket holders, and we usually drive to the games and park in the garage. But last week, we decided to take the Dart train. And so we took the Dart train to the Dallas Mavericks game. And on the way back, the train, on the way from Plano, suburban Plano, you can take the train from Plano all the way to the Dallas Mavericks. And when you get to the bad areas in the inner city, the train either goes up or it goes down until you get past all of that. And so you can go from Plano to, to American Airlines Center without seeing anything bad. On the way back, we decided that we we would we'd take the train back, but this time we had to take a tra get a transfer at the LBJ Central Center. That's part of Hamilton Park. And so we transferred from the orange line to the red line at LBJ Central. And when we got on the train, there appeared to be in the very front where we were, a homeless person. I looked at him, and when we first got on the a train, uh, there was a stench throughout the train. He was not tidy. As a matter of fact, he was dirty. His hair was not combed. There was a great smell from him. And he had a bag of clothes that looked like it was all his belongings in the entire world. And right there in the front, my wife, Sandra, took a seat across from him, and I said, let's take a seat a couple of rows back. And we did. And then as I thought about it, I saw him again. And I saw him from my shameful perspective. I said to Sean Sandre, let's take a seat back because I didn't want to go through the smell. And I didn't know if he would wake up and beg uh, me for anything. So I, as I thought about it later, I thought about this shameful perspective. I saw him with my eyes. I, I smelled him with my senses. And with my senses, I, I, I saw his value, how I had devalued him, and how I looked at him with a bias. What I saw would not lead me to oneness, or the way I re re reacted toward him, would not lead me to oneness with God. I had an opportunity God had given me, but because I acted the way I did, I didn't want to go through the smell, I didn't want him to beg me, and I, I, was, and I saw all of his belongings. And I saw that God had given me an opportunity. I've been on this quest to be one with God, to have union with God, to have intimacy with God, to know God like I'd never known God before. And God took this, this frail man and gave me an opportunity for what I've been reaching for, for, and I missed it. At that moment, when I said, let's go back and take another seat, there was no union between God and me. There was no union with God and me. There was no oneness between God and me. There was no oneness between God and me or with this gentleman because had it been, I would have seen him. <clears throat> if I had had oneness with God, I would have seen him. Not with my eyes, but with God's eyes. And I, had I seen him or had oneness with God, I wouldn't have smelled him with my nose, but I would have smelled him as God would have smelled him. 
had, had I been in union with God, <clears throat> uh, I would not have heard him adjudge him with my, my value system, but I would have looked at him with the value system of God. It was a divine moment for me to reach what I'd been reaching for for 30 years, and I missed it. Had I looked at him as God saw him, I would have seen a spark of divinity in him. If, if I would have looked at him uh, as God seen him, I would, have, I would have wondered, I would have acted, because when I saw him, I had all kind of questions. I wondered, where was he going? I wondered, what was he going to do? Because Plano was the last stop. And there he was with all of his belongings. And there were policemen on the car. And I thought at the end, they would take care of him. It was raining. I rushed from the train. Then I saw this title in my mind, this text. My longing, my thirst for divine intimacy. <clears throat> I would have seen, if I looked at this guy, I would have seen not just him, but I would have seen the suffering of Christ. Had I looked at him with divine eyes, <clears throat> with the oneness of God, I would have seen the fragile fresh, the fragile flesh of Jesus Christ. Had I looked at him with the eyes of God, I would have seen wounded humanity, a broken cosmos or world. <clears throat> My friends, it is Lent. And it, uh, Lent could be, have been a time for me that night to let go. You know, look, when we look at Lent, we look at uh, our, our spirituality, our action, but it's also a time when we let go what is not good for us. And I thought about me and that man that night, that gentleman, I thought this could have been a good time for me to let go some things. It could have been a time for me to let go my disingenuous holiness. Hello, somebody. It could have been a time for me to let go my, 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 my value that the world values. It could have been a time for me to let go <clears throat> of my own sedative spirituality. Could have been a time for me to let go of unhealthy and unholy bias. Letting go the need to feel good, smell good, and dress good. Rather, it could have been for me a time to engage the divinity, <clears throat> engage the divine, and find oneness with God. <clears throat> it was an opportunity, it was an opportunity to offer generosity to others. <clears throat> it was my opportunity to connect with the devotion of God and action to God. And then it occurred to me when I thought about how I overlooked him and wanted to sit at another place and missed my communion with God that I heard the words of Jesus, and you did it unto me. <clears throat> Now, I saw that what I thirst for was differently. The eye in which I see God is the same eye in which God sees me. My eye and God's eyes are one eye. One seeing, one love for God, one love for all humanity. humanity. Now, my friends, Lent journey is almost coming to a close now. And as Lent comes to a whole close, we remember Sunday. But it wasn't long after Sunday that we'll see the tumultuous final days of Jesus of Nazareth's earthly life. <clears throat> from one week time, we go from the excitement of Palm Sunday to the climatic moments when he overturned tables because of the commerce of the temple, followed by the Last Supper, foot washing in the upper room, the agony of the garden before his arrest, scourging, and finally his crucifixion. In a few days, Lent will be out of our minds. Our 40 days in the wilderness are coming to an end. How will I you continue to pray and fast and offer generosity to others? <clears throat> Teresa of Avila Give us an answer when she says to you and me that if we want 
to make progress in the path, in the spiritual way, if we want to ascend to God where I have longed for, if we want intimacy with God, then the important thing is not to think, but to do. Not to think much, but to love much. To do whatever awakens that which is in us. Teresa of Avila said, love is the key to communion with God. <clears throat> Howard Thurman, a modern day mystic, African American Baptist preacher said, don't ask what the world needs. Ask what makes you come alive because the, lure, the world doesn't need to do anything. The world needs people who have come alive. St. Francis and St. Clara of Assisi, they came alive when they saw the crucified Christ and took on the suffering of humanity. MLK Jr. came alive when he took on the pain and the suffering of the civil rights movement, integration, and intervene for others. Thinking is good, but love is better. The mystical life, mystical love, expresses itself in yearning and fulfillment, not just for intimacy, but to satisfy this intimacy of being in union with God and with one another. And so I come to remind us that to see the crucified Christ in all of his ugliness, fragile and frail body, a bruised body, is to identify with him. <clears throat> I'm almost through now. Uh, a few days ago, a lady saw me and we shook hands. And she said to me, uh, you have some very soft hands. I had just gotten a manicure. She said, your hands are soft. <clears throat> and I was smiling because I had a brand new fresh manicure. And then she said to me, your hands feel like you ain't worked a day in your life. <laughs> I was thinking about the crucified Christ in his hands. And then the other night, my wife had a little surgery in her hand and uh, to fix a ligament in her hand. And I was there pondering. The lady said, you got soft hands. You got smooth hands. She said, your hands like you hadn't worked a day of your life. And then Sandra said, look at my hand. And I looked at her hand. She said, look at it. <clears throat> she said, look at the blood. They still got blood uh, from the surgery. She said, look at my hand. It's, it's, it's swelling up and it's, it's scarred from the surgery. Look at it. <clears throat> and then I thought about it and I said, girl, you got the right kind of hands. Because the Savior we love had scarred hand and a scarred body. He was bruised and wrecked for you and me. I said, girl, you got the right hands and you can identify with Christ because those scarred hands. And so identifying with the crucified Christ, love, devotion, and action is an intersection where we can identify with the one who came and took on humanity and suffering and, and, and execution and crucifixion so that we can have this divine communion, oneness with Almighty God. Amen.